have a bucket or a basket you're welcome to put into and I'm going to go right into my message now. The title of this message is freedom. Uh, this word freedom is a loaded word. When I was born again at the age of 17 I, I read mostly the word liberty because in the King James Version they use the word liberty to, to define or to translated from this original Greek word. So I want to start in the concept of freedom and I, I cannot get away from this subject because you'll notice that I have consecutively, hey, Mr. Young, welcome, I have consecutively been uh, covering the subject of not being connected to the bondage of religion, not being connected to the things that Jesus came to fight that Paul had a battle against his whole ministry. And so uh, in a greater focus on this word freedom, while I was in Indonesia, uh, I was preparing one of the mornings and the Lord spoke the word to me. He said, freedom. And he said it right after it occurred to me, oh, I don't have a message yet for Sunday. And this was way back on uh, Thursday. And he said, freedom. And I said, amen, freedom, that's right. He says, no, I want you to preach on freedom. So I was like, oh, oh, I got it, got it, okay. And so uh, it's a simple message built around what the Bible says in the original language of Greek about freedom. And I want to start freedom defined. We see in Galatians 5, 1, it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Now, Paul, writing those churches in Galatia, of course, we know that that region was a place that had never heard about Jesus. Then the message came to them fresh. They received it, re accepted Christ, and began to live in the Spirit. Miracles were there. They received the Holy Spirit. They were walking in the Holy Spirit. And as soon as Paul moved along to other areas, People came in with bondage. The Judaizers came in and began to uh, attack those people or get them to come away from the freedom that they had in their expression and their personality with Christ and come into a form of religious structure with laws, ideally or specifically mentioning circumcision. And this word uh, freedom is from the group eleutheria, freedom, liberty, license the liberty to do as one pleases so if i say be at your liberty it means i have no restrictions on you you do whatever you want if you came to my house and i wanted you to feel at home how often do we say things like feel free and then we add to that feel free to look around in the fridge if you want something i do that all the time people come to stay at our house I say, look, this is your house. When I was in Mexico for 10 years, we learned uh, mi casa es su casa. Like, my house is your house. So when they come and stay, I say, I say, just go, go. We have a back fridge. We have a front fridge. Go and get anything you want. Take it. Feel free to take whatever you want. In other words, I put no restrictions on them, no boundaries. If there are boundaries... I would put those. I may say, feel free to take anything and do whatever you want. Just don't touch my Star Wars Legos. That would be like the only restriction that I might put in the room. Don't mess with my, my private little area. But if I do not want someone to touch something, I then put it somewhere else, right? What do I do? If I don't want them to touch something delicate, or maybe I'm embarrassed that a 52-year-old man has Legos, then I would hide those somewhere in a room, a private office, and that's my own joy. So we think about freedoms and how they work in natural senses, the way that we live our lives. And this is exactly what God is expecting us to do, that we are self-cognizant or we understand ourselves and we are governing ourselves. We are in control of our own heart, our own mind and our lives. Why? Because we've been given a license by God to be free. And it was for that very purpose of freedom that he set us free. Jesus came and paid for us so that we could be free. You are free. How many of you know Jesus is your Savior? Yeah, you've met him probably years ago. Most of us are older Christians, so we've known Jesus for a while. That means we are free. To say I receive Jesus should be synonymous with I am free. 
I am no longer a slave to the things of the world. I'm no longer a slave to the doctrines of men. I am free. I have license to do whatever I want to do, especially in the spiritual realm, especially in the kingdom of God. So there are no chains on me. You've been liberated from every form of bondage and slavery by the Most High God that made it possible by sending Jesus. The work of the cross did that for you. So it's up to you to walk in that freedom every day of your life. That's why he says you're going to have to stand firm in it because he's telling them, look, people are coming against this. And so from the very beginning of this word freedom, we start to see that the entire the entire existence of man has been a battle for freedom. It's a war that we're constantly fighting. So sin ended the freedom that man had in the garden at creation. So you think of it that way. Man was originally made and given complete freedom. You are free to eat any of the fruit of the trees. However, don't touch my Legos. Or, however, don't eat from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Very simple rule. Now, freedom then, it stands to reason for us as Christians and for everybody, of course, it has limits. There can't be complete freedom to do whatever we want, wherever we want, whenever we want to anyone, because then that would be anarchy and it would result in some disastrous outcomes. So we're free, but within certain realms. How many of you feel free in your own home? How many of you feel more free in your home than anywhere else on the planet? Why? Because it's your home. Because that's where you live. And you will do things, say things, eat things, drink things, live things in your house that you may not do anywhere else. Because why? You are free. How many of you walk in your front door and this happens? You know that feeling? That's freedom. Because now you're not restricted. How many of you go to sleep on that last day of work knowing that the alarm does not have to be set tomorrow morning? What happens that night? You're, ah, oh, it just feels so good. Why? Because there's no chains on you. Yay. You want to run around the room. and That's how I feel on Sunday. This is my last service of the week. So I've been, all week I've been gone. So Sundays I'm like wound up to this last meeting. At the end of this meeting, that's why you see me just kind of mellow out. I run out of steam and just sit somewhere. And I, I'm so happy because I have Monday's my day off. And who knows what I, I'm. See, tomorrow being my day off, it's free. I do whatever I want to do. I don't, have, I don't have to preach tomorrow. I don't have to teach tomorrow. Well, brother, don't you like to teach and preach the word of God? Isn't it a great privilege and an honor to do so? Well, of course it is, but not tomorrow. Because even the principle of Sabbath was built upon a man's freedom from having to work for at least one day. In other words, God hardwired into even the law freedom. Be free. Be free. Paul the apostle knew the scriptures very well. He knew the whole Old Testament. He memorized the Old Testament. He knew the Pentateuch by heart. He had to as a Pharisee. So he knew these things and he knew the law, but yet he was the, the architect of the definitions of freedom that we follow in the Word of God. So that means he could find in the law, because remember his only Bible was the law. The only Everything he taught, it says daily he taught and explain the scriptures. What scriptures was he talking? He did not have the, the gospel of John. He had the Pentateuch. He had the prophets. So he had the law and the prophets. And out of that, the imagery that was coming out of the law, of that, without being obligated to do it, his freedom was no longer do we have to live by these laws, but oh, what a beautiful law they are. And James refers to it as the perfect law of liberty. So a new law came in. That we're no longer under the bondage. We are free to do whatever you want. Even if the Bible tells you that you must do a thing, really, you're free to do whatever you want. And God doesn't want you to feel that if you don't do this, I'm going to hit you. I'm going to hurt you. That's not the system he's looking for. He's looking for the heartfelt convictions concerning choices made about your freedom. And this is where we really start to focus on, on freedom. Sin ended the freedom that man had in the garden of crea at creation, but Jesus had to come and reverse that curse. I made a post today, you know, Jesus died to reverse the curse because it just has a nice ring to it. 
And it's true. The curse has been, it was a curse of bondage, a curse of slavery to sin that was reversed by Jesus when he took it off of us. So now I want us to consider this in light of this word freedom and look at the very birth of the ministry of Jesus. Let me catch you up to this next scripture. It's Jesus. He has been conceived by the Holy Spirit, spent nine months in his mother's womb at an inopportune time, at an inopportune place, in a miserable circumstance, he was born, because that's how God does everything. And Jesus was then laid in the manger. Then he was picked up and marked or prophesied upon by people who came to confirm who he was by the wise men or, or the magicians that came, these astrologers that came, also by the shepherds in the field. And so he began to grow, and little by little, as the years went by, by the age of his early teens, he already was showing some great promise and was asking such powerful questions to the religious leaders that they were scratching their head about this guy. Of course, their parents, his parents were not happy about that because they thought he was with them and they lost him for a few days there, which I always make fun of because imagine being trusted with the child Messiah and you lost him. How would you feel? That's why they were so stressed out. Of course, that they lost their baby boy, but that God, they knew who he was. At least they put it in their hearts, the Bible said. But so now Jesus grows up, and then the next time we see him is at the age of 30, when the time is right, and John is preparing the way for him, and then suddenly he shows up on the beach, and John says, Behold the Lamb of God, which was John's very purpose. We saw that recently. And so Jesus came, was baptized, came, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and then immediately, driven by the Holy Spirit, he went out into the wilderness where he was tempted. We've also read about that recently, where he passed those tests, and having passed the test and had the seal of approval upon him by God himself, he went and started his ministry. That's where we find this scripture, this next one, in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now I want us to take a good hard look at this mission statement. This is the manifesto of Christ. His ministry is about to begin. After this, he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled before you. I am the fulfillment of this. Of course, they didn't take too kindly to that and wanted to throw him off a cliff. But he stated what his ministry was. His mission statement is freedom. Understand, the very foundation of the ministry of Christ is freedom that he came. It was for freedom that he set us free. But we are free because Jesus is the one that frees us. And this Holy Spirit is upon The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom. So Jesus, into a world of bondage, and at that time, the dispensation of law came to its most far extreme and twisted, demented, man-manipulated realm. That it was the height of religiosity when Jesus stepped on the earth. And that's why they crucified him, because they just could not handle anything that deviated from their definitions, their control through religion. And Jesus steps into that bondage, declaring freedom, demonstrating freedom with several laboratory experiments or public shows of taking grain and, and rubbing it in their hands and eating it on the Sabbath, healing people, saving healings just for the Sabbath to make everybody angry because his ministry was freedom. And he came to bring that freedom to all people. And it's a beautiful thing. The word there for free, it means unbound, unshackled, free to realize one's destiny, free, not a slave or not under restraint, like I said, so that the word Free, he came to set us free. If you are free, then you fit this definition. You're unbound, unshackled, free to realize your destiny. How many of you are glad you're free to realize your destiny? 
what God has for you, yes. But so much of it is us. In the conference there with the pastors, I was talking about the amalgam of man and God and how that we go and do, he works with us, confirming with signs and wonders. So it is a symbiotic relationship. We are not just mindless automatons that do precisely whatever God says to us. It doesn't work that way. Of course, we obey God, but he wants us to pursue by our freedom how we can best serve him. He may give us some general pointers and tips and direction, but as far as a specificity, he would never give me an exact specificity for my ministry. Why not? Because he set me free for freedom. That means even within my ministry, I need to choose what to do. So he gives me talents. He puts them in my hands. And what I do with that is up to me. But nowhere in the parable of the talents did the, the, the future king or the master who went away tell them, look, here's some talents. You, you better. He didn't warn them and say, you better multiply these. Don't end up with just one buried in the backyard because there's going to be hell to pay for that. And by the way, if you do this, he didn't even tell them that. He just put it in their hands and he left it up to them. And that is exactly what he does with us. The talent he gives us first and foremost is the freedom he's provided. So now we start thinking of freedom as a valuable commodity from heaven. That it is a substance, it is a presence, and it is a lifestyle that we can live, but for what? And that's where the Bible really starts to make some clear assessments of man when freedom goes in the wrong way. So we have freedom, but I want us to look at some scriptures. They said, God, he, he made earth, but man makes prisons. Let me say it that way. God made earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, but man makes religion. And that's why Jesus always said, beware of the doctrines of men and beware of the doctrines of the Pharisees. In other words, the doctrines were laws and rules that God did not make. And that's why Jesus would correct them and say, well, you've heard it say, you've heard them say this. And when he would say, you heard them say versus it is written, that was the difference between what man said and what God said. So you go back and look up those, you'll see this is what God said, it is written. And the other, you've heard it said, is meaning what men have said out of their mouth. And that's why he was contending with that. And so we covered that in the past. But Jesus sets us free from the structures of man. The entire ministry of Jesus was a mission to bring freedom to man in a world of bondage. Sin through man constructed many prisons for humanity to be restricted and bound. Sin bound us to eternal separation from God. Think about the biggest prison is hell. Hell is a byproduct of the lack of freedom that sin brings. Because under the bondage of sin and inability to escape it, your only place to go is prison. And because the complete opposite of freedom would be slavery or imprisonment. That you're put in a prison, you're absolutely limited, you cannot go anywhere. I always think of the movie Shawshank Redemption, one of my favorite movies about a man in prison that was put there, but it was really not his fault. A great movie, I saw, I rewatched it the other day. Every once in a while when I, I get tired of new movies, I go back to the old ones I know are good. Because now 10, 15, 20 years have gone by and... And I remember, remember that movie, and I like doing that, and Netflix helps me do that as well as the internet. But that man was in bondage. It gives you a picture of what it's like. Did not matter, even truth did not matter. He was bound there. And that's exactly what a lot of the institutions of man become for us, prisons that we make. And so freedom is choice. Man-made prisons of doctrines, the man-made prisons and rules bind us to the inability to reason and think with God. And that's Jesus said, or God said in the Bible, come let us reason together. He wants you to logically think with him. But religion does not like that. Religion wants you to simply obey. And, and Jesus wants something different. I don't want sacrifice, I want mercy. He wants a heart that feels. He wants compassion. He wants kindness. So freedom actually is a choice. Uh, freedom is the ability to do exactly what you want to do and when you want to do it. And God is completely and always free. We look at God, right? We were created in his image and his likeness. 
Is there any bondage on God? Is God restricted in any way? No, not at all. Does God do anything at any time that he wants to do? In a way, yes, and in a way, no. There's a lot of things he does not do. Well, you say, how do you say that? Well, Jesus was God. Did you, Even Satan said, I know any minute you can call a legion of angels. Satan knew what he could do. Satan knew the ultimate freedom of the Christ, that he could do anything. In any moment, he could do it. Any moment. And sometimes he got a little frivolous with his miracles, cursing fig trees, walking on water. I mean, that, that doesn't really serve any purpose other than a demonstration. But he's, he was free to do that. He'd do it every once. Who's going to criticize him? Who's going to say, hey, you know, that's a little flamboyant. No, it's Jesus. He's free to do whatever he wants. But think of how much he was holding back. Think of how much. That's why the disciples were so frustrated. With him. Let's call fire out on him. He's like, no, 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 no. You don't even know what spirit you're of. Because Jesus was the spirit of meekness, control. And that's where the Bible really starts to tell us about God's perspective of freedom for us. Why does he give us freedom? So we have to have an understanding about the desires of God for man before we make these free choices we have. Otherwise, we just run out there and just willy-nilly choose everything, do whatever we want. Imagine being given an unlimited budget, an unlimited time. Uh, Solomon did. Solomon had unlimited money. He tried everything. Go read Ecclesiastes. He basically, imagine, he was like the richest person that ever lived. He was just, you know, made Bezos look like a pauper. So he had so much money. He could do whatever he wanted to do. And he did. And he says, I tried this. He, it says he tried drugs. He tried alcohol. He tried women. He tried folly. He tried silliness. He tried construction projects. He did everything and he did it well because he was granted the greatest level of wisdom ever given to man. And what was his conclusion after all that? This is a big waste of time. It's all vanity. It's all like grasping at the wind. It doesn't accomplish anything. So he found out to the extreme what freedom could do. And so we think about that. We think about all the people in the Bible that did not. Moses was called the meekest man that ever lived. And he was strength under control. Anyway, we're going to look. There are actually 11 times the Greek word that we're studying appears in the Bible. But I have reduced it down to five because of some redundancies and some inapplicable uses of the word concerning our topic. So five facts about kingdom freedom. Let's pray. Father, we accept the fact that it was for freedom that you set us free. We say thank you. Thank you for that freedom. Thank you for giving us that freedom. Thank you for removing the chains. We're so grateful. Teach us how to stand firm in that freedom and never again return to the yoke of slavery. Help us, Lord. Bless this time and this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one, freedom is under our control for good. This is an important concept that we have to understand. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 27. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, well, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. Let's just say somebody says, hey, you want to go have dinner? Say, yeah, sure. You go out to eat with them. You don't know much question's not coming up. Maybe you do know that they're of a certain faith. Maybe they're Hindu. Maybe they're Muslim. Maybe they're Buddhist. Whatever. All of these cultures around the world in which we live in Singapore, we have them all. They all do what this passage is just talking about concerning the Corinthians. They have connections with gods, different deities, altars, and some food is in fact offered to altars. People do have altars in their homes. And they do pass the food by it and bless it by their gods. But He's saying if they don't tell you that, they're not saying it, then don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. The Bible says we all know that the worthless idols are not even animate. They're inanimate objects. They're made out of stone and wood. But don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just eat whatever. Freedom. So initiating, he's telling them, be free. to Just do whatever you want. But if some, here comes, now freedom is coming against the wall that God is expecting. If someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. Both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. 
And he clarifies, says, I'm, I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. Because Paul taught and laid the foundation of such freedom that he knew his disciples didn't have trouble with this, that they were free. And they were free. In fact, it was a problem and it caused problems. That's why people went to go see how dare they be that free. Believe me, I've had free churches all around the world, different countries, and the religious people can't stand that. They don't like it at all. They don't like the freedoms. And so if they see a freedom that disturbs them, they will, they will criticize it, come after it, usually not to your face. At least the Pharisees were in Jesus' face. But a lot of church people, just they just whisper behind your back. Well, in that church, you know, they do this or they don't do this or whatever the other, it's just whatever there is. But in this particular case, for conscience sake, I'm referring to other person's conscience, not yours, Paul said. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? Hmm, that's a good question. Why should it be? So Paul lived in this freedom and he said, why should my freedom be judged by that guy's conscience that invited me to his house to eat? Now, it's a rhetorical question. He's not looking for your answer. He's making a statement to teach here. Why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? Paul knew that the ultimate authority of a free believer is you could, you could bless anything. You could bless it and pray for it. I don't care how many gods it's offered to. It's irrelevant. So it's not the issue of the food. It's not the issue of the altar or the gods or the restaurant or the home or even the person physically. It all comes down to conscience. It all comes down to their mentality and their spirituality or their lack thereof. So that's what Paul's most concerned about. So freedom is under our control in this regard. So we need to understand that about freedom that we have been given it that it, this thing is ours. We own that freedom. Freedom is offered to you. Take it. Hold on to it. The Bible says hold on to it. Stand firm. Guard it. We'll talk more about that later. And so we have this. We can do whatever we want. It's under our control. Uh, but be careful. It's under your control. Yes, you own that freedom. And if you think of it that way, if you own something, you have the right to do whatever you wish with it. It's under your control. If you take your MacBook and you're banging on it and dropping it on the ground, what am I going to say? Hey, don't do that. It's your MacBook. You do whatever you want with it. It's your iPad. Hand it to the kids. Have them throw it down the stairs. And You know, it's, it's fine. Just for a moment's peace. You don't care. But maybe I don't like that. Well, that's not mine. It's your possession. So you do whatever you want with it. It's the same with your freedom. Your freedom is yours. So in freedom's sake, you are free. To do whatever you want with your freedom. So now start thinking of freedom as an object that's been given to you. You can do so. Freedom is powerful. Freedom in concept alone is poison in the camp of Satan. It is a, a venom that can destroy the kingdoms of this world. Freedom is scary. Nations fear freedom. When a, when a people rise up demanding freedom, Gosh, my nation was born because of the pursuit of freedom. It's written in our Constitution. The freedom, because why? Because the Church of England and the leaders of that nation were saying that you couldn't, they put so many restrictions and laws on the way that the people believed in God that they could not tolerate it any longer. And so they said, we would rather sail across the ocean and die trying to survive in some backwoods, foreign place we've never seen before than sit here being restricted by your laws and your rules. So a group of them got together, got a few ships, and went over there to do that. That's the history of my country. That's where it all started in the pursuit of freedom. And it's a beautiful thing. I love my history. I love my country. I like the idea of it. And it's free. So now if, if I have a right to do whatever I want with that freedom, I also have to understand it's in my control for good, which means I should start thinking about the way that I use that freedom. Uh, you do not flaunt your freedom before captives no more than you go to a prison and mock the prisoners. 
Who goes to a prison and says, ha ha, you're in prison. <laughs> you idiots. Ah, you should have known better. Just stand out, just to sit there and railing on them stupid prisoners. <laughs> you know, bring a lawn chair and a Coca-Cola and just sit there. Yeah, just, just right outside the bars. You know, no, who would do that? It's so cruel and mean to do that. But that's exactly what it's like if you've been given freedom by God. Now, we're not even going into Romans chapter 14 and the liberties that we live becoming an offense or a rock for stumbling for someone. But that's what I'm referring to. If you've been given these freedoms and someone is in bondage, you have to approach them in a certain way. Do you approach them with your freedom brashly and say, I'm free. I can do whatever I want. Well, unfortunately, a lot of believers do that. And when they do that as a protest against bondage, it becomes an offense. And those people, now it's different. If someone comes to you and attacks your freedoms, there's a big difference. Then you have a right to defend that freedom. But you don't take your freedom over into someone's face and push it on them because that's not a spirit of love. And so freedom is conservative, although free. And we must be careful to conservatively measure out the results of our freedom to be like Christ. As I said, Jesus conserved his freedom carefully to put himself in a position to do good for everybody in the right time. If he had been too free too soon and did what he wanted to do, he would not have been as effective as he was. His effectiveness was based upon his ability to use his freedom correctly. And I find that it is a, is kind of a call to us to do the same thing. Number two, freedom opens our eyes. 2 Corinthians 3, 15, even to this day, when Moses is read, he's referring to the Pentateuch again, the books of Moses, a veil covers their hearts. Their hearts, they, he's talking about the religious people of his generation, the Jews. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now his Lord is Jesus. Whoever turns to the Lord Jesus, the veil is taken away. Now the, the Lord is the Spirit. That's interesting. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So now this is interesting to look at it in context. Our eyes are open in the presence of God. When we enter his presence and find a place in the manifest presence of God, the veil is taken away and our sight is restored. So what we see in that place changes us forever. So now it's interesting to see where freedom comes. Freedom is born where? It's born in the presence of the Spirit. Freedom itself comes from the spirit of liberty. And where the spirit is, there is freedom. Where the spirit is not, there is bondage. It's really quite simple. Today I was teaching to the Chinese congregation uh, in the morning about the parable of the sower. And how it's so clear. Jesus said in explanation, what in, in between the meat, between the two pieces of bread, the parable of the sower and its explanation is a phrase the disciples say, why do you speak them in parables? Well, you know, to you, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom is given, but to them, no. So when he said that, I started thinking about it. And sometime back, I asked the Lord, why were they given the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom and these other guys were not? Why did you insist on speaking to them in parables so that they wouldn't, hearing they would not hear and uh, understanding they would not understand, you know, as the, he quoted the prophet Isaiah. So Why? What was the difference between these guys and these guys? Well, it's very simple. It's such a simple answer. These guys were with Jesus all the time. And those other guys were not with Jesus all the time. So the ratio of time spent with Jesus versus time spent without Jesus was vastly different. Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom of revelation. Freedom of understanding. When I was teaching that this morning, the spirit of conviction came in the room and I started 
I use the analogy of computers, iPads, and phones, and in the new iOS, you actually have a usage meter that will tell you exactly what you do on your phone and what percentages of your energy are being spent where. And I have a Bible app in my phone, and I was embarrassed to find out that it was dwarfed significantly by my, by my Facebook usage. And I realized, wow, I'm on the outside with that if I'm not careful. Of course, to be fair to myself, I use my MacBook primarily for my Bible study. And that MacBook is almost exclusively used for Bible, except for some YouTube golf things. But other than that, I have to learn the swing. I got to be able to get, I, I hate driver. I need to get it. I'm having trouble with the driver. Oh, you play golf? Oh, never mind. You have no use to me at all then. <laughs> I ask people all the time. Just so happens, people in the Chinese church, they all play golf. So it's, gosh, right before the service, all we were talking about. Golf, 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 this, that, how, this, what about this, that, the other. But here we then see this freedom that comes where the Lord is. The Lord is the Spirit. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus said, Lord, I'll be with you always. He comes in the form of the Holy Spirit to the end of the age. And the more time we spend in that presence, the freer we become. In fact, when you're in the presence of God, don't you feel free? When you worship and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, you do that sigh just like you do when you go in your house and close the door. And you feel this great relief because the chains are falling off because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And you rest and you feel so good. But then the worship service comes to an end and the message ends and we pray and you go on. Well, now you're back on your own fight. You're in your own battle. So then how can you keep that freedom going? Well, just, it's the ones with Jesus all the time knew the secrets. The ones that are in the presence just stay in the presence of God all the time. Is that even possible? Of course it's possible. You can walk and live in the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit 24 hours a day. As much as you want. And the more time you do that, the more time you spend meditating in his word and in prayer. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not looking to put prayer bondage on you and word bondage. If you don't read 15 chapters a day, you're going to burn in hell. I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about contemplative. Jesus said, consider carefully the words. And in the Greek, it's take a long time to think about. And so that means don't just like read, okay, done, and close it and be done. But that's not what he wants. It's not a checklist, but it's something you look and think, hmm, let me think about that. Meditate on it. Meditate on it. You don't stick, if the word is a seed planted on fertile ground, a seed doesn't germinate instantly and sprout up instantly it takes time so it is with every scripture every passage the lord gives me i take it in i have this habit of sitting back in my chair i put it on my computer i copy paste it on my microsoft word program or pages depending on what i'm using and i lean back in the chair and i fold my arms and type nothing and do nothing and i just stare at it and i consider it carefully and as I do that, it alone, it says the soil will produce the seed. I'm the soil. But I need to be patient with the soil. Once the seed of the word goes in me, I need to wait. And where do I wait? I wait in the presence of God. And there is the spirit of liberty. And suddenly that seed germinates and it's, ah, oh, oh, you know those moments. Oh, that's cool. You ever been excited about your own revelations? You get something and you just feel good about the fact that you got it. And you're like, that's what I'm talking about. Revelation man over here. I got it. I figure I figured this out. And of course, Jesus says in the very next verse there that you don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. You put it on a lampstand. So when that revelation comes, you want to preserve it. You have to tell somebody. Publish it. You can go Facebook, put it on Facebook, tell people your revelation, whatever. That's a good way to publish it in this day and age. But better yet, go tell your Christian brother or sister. Even better yet, tell your non-Christian brother and sister. Today I was telling them, I quote scriptures all the time to people who are non-Christian. And I even put them on Facebook because I have a lot of friends on Facebook that are not Christian. Some good friends. Friends that teach meditation. In Buddhism, friends that are strict Muslims, friends that, these are good friends though. I love these people. 
And so I put scriptures all the time. But some somebody told me one time, well, you forgot to put this, the chapter and verse. I don't. On purpose, I don't. Because how do you plant a seed? It's better that it not be recognized. Seeds are hard to recognize anyway. Just post wisdom. Yes, it's scripture. You don't have to say all the time. You know, I just want to share a little wisdom with you. Matthew chapter 15, verse 3. You know, you don't like, it's like you're attacking them aggressively with the Bible. Like, this is the word of God. Just let it slip out of your lips. Just, just say it. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. That's what I do taxi drivers all the time. Very few of them are actually Christian, maybe one in five. And I, I just start speaking scriptures like I'm just talking. How's your family? I get into issues of life and just Bible just starts flowing out of me like it's my words. You know why? Because they are my words. He gave them to me. Father, I have given them your words, he said. In the 17th chapter of John. But I take possession of those words and I speak to them as if they're my own. I don't have to connect. There's some believers you have to connect the chapter and verse to every single thing that you say. And if you don't know exactly where it's, I don't know where half of them are, honestly. I have to Google it. I know the scripture. I can recite it. But half the time, honestly, I don't remember where it's at. Especially if it's in some obscure neighborhood like Zephaniah or something like that. I have to I have to search it and find it. Because I've never pursued the Bible mechanically. I've always pursued it emotionally. And the revelation of the life, it's freedom. Whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein. I look into the law of freedom of the New Testament. And I love it. By the way, that's chapter two. One James. No, I don't see. I don't have to tell you that. I know where it's at, but it's just life, and that's exactly what happens in the presence. And all who, with unveiled faces, contemplates the Lord, Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So this is a transformation that comes to us when we turn to the Lord, and we are made to see things. We've never seen before that metamorphosizes us. The metamorphosis in the Greek, that word transformed is the same as transfigured with Jesus on the mountain. It's the only places it's used in the whole Bible. So we can be transfigured, altered and changed into light bearing beings. What is light but revelation? Freedom. The very thing he came to give recovery of sight to the blind. His mission statement of freedom. If the Holy Spirit is present with us, we have an opportunity to have our eyes open. But we must take advantage of that moment to gain spiritual insights into what God has for us. Whenever you feel the anointing, whenever you're in the presence of God, just tell him, open the eyes of my heart. So I sang that song on purpose. I know it's old. I sang a bunch of old songs today. One brand new song written by Gabriel, which I really like. So it's interesting to note also his image. It says that transform into his image. And immediately you interpret this to mean, and I'm on your side, the image of God, how God is. But what if it could also mean, and this is just a conjecture, what if it could also mean an image that he's projecting to you of what will be of you in the future? transformation, changing of your life is you getting directions from the wisdom of God from heaven about what to do. He does this pictorially. I prayed for that couple in Tanjung Pinong. I saw the school. I described it exactly. And they knew that I was describing their blueprints. That's, that's how we have it set up. It's going to be like that. So that was a picture. I saw the image from God. Where? Where the Spirit of the Lord was. I was the last to pray. I waited because I had my team with me, and they're so anointed, it's crazy. So they prayed, and the glory of God was everywhere. And they think I'm just, you know, waiting because I'm the pastor. I'm going to be the last one to pray. No, I'm letting the atmosphere just grow and grow. They're, they're ramping it up. Now the whole I can't go wrong at that point. Because it's not about me anyway. It's about the presence of the Most High God. So where the Holy Spirit is, I, I put them out there. It's fun too. I do that in altar calls. I just shove them out there. Have all the people line up. Go ahead, team. 
recently released them like hounds. I mean, they're after Caleb is like a hound. He's like, give me somebody. You know, he goes into the crowd, just ah, and then people are falling and screaming and being filled with God's presence and healed. And I'm just pacing myself. Because by then, the, the frenzy of faith has been produced because when someone sees someone receive, their faith rises a notch and they start receiving. And the more people that receive from God, the more have faith to receive. So you see kind of a domino effect that happens in those meetings. And that's why I, I'm waiting to the right time. And it's easy. I can come up with a finger. Boop. <laughs> Boom. Like dead people. And people think, wow, he's so anointed. I'm not anointed. God, spirit, is now active, moving, and flowing. So I send my guys out there to do the hard work. They're plowing the field out there, praying for the person that's doing this. Staring at you. You know, that moment of empty hands on empty heads where you're praying. And I know I'm not going to pray for that guy. Let them worry about that. And I look for the ones. I'm teasing partially, but partially not. But he gives you an image. Really, he did that for me in Acapulco. When I built the tent, he showed me a picture of that tent, and I went and made it. In India, he showed me the river training center, and I made it. I saw it in a vision. In fact, there's only three times that I've seen crystal clear vision of church facilities. It was the tent. Actually, I saw this place. I, I, I did see this carpet and see the curtains and everything in here. But it was a, 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 the tent in Acapulco, the river ministry uh, thing that we did in India that Myra now owns, operates and has, and um, just now in Tanjung Pinang. To that level of clarity. And because of that's why I feel like, oh no, we're hooked now. We're going to have to be a part of that ministry. We're going to have to be connected. Because why would God show me so clearly the paint on the walls, the texture of the walls I saw, everything, the tiles on the floor, and in, in my vision today, I walked every hall. It was so clear. It was scary. Because when the vision came, I got very, very sleepy. And that has only happened to me one other time in my life. Also in Indonesia, when he put me into a trance to show me the Syrophoenician woman. And today, that I, was, I just I couldn't keep my eyes open. I put my head down and, and just in suddenly I was standing in that facility. Why? Because it's an image that God gives us. So the image is the image of Christ, but he's showing us also the image of things to come so that we have goals, that we have things we want to achieve and that we can step out and do that. I like that they don't have the money for that facility, but they're clearing the ground. While we were standing there praying, they're felling trees. I mean, this big tree just... I worried that maybe Matthews was under it. I was like, hey, where's our guys? Did you? I bet Matthew's worried about the same thing because he takes care of everybody. He watches everything. But so we were standing in the middle of that scene. God do what God wants to do. It's a good and exciting thing. I, I see now. I see also a great kill an entire nation coming to revival in Christ by my influence. An entire nation. I don't know. God's always shown me that. I keep pushing it aside. He keeps showing it to me. I keep pushing it aside. I keep showing it. I don't know what nation, though, which is really maddening. I wish he would tell me what nation. I somehow suspect Vietnam, but I could be totally wrong. But who knows? Whatever the case, we're going to all do it together because you're the ones I'm going to put out there on the altar calls and make you good. <laughs> and you know you like doing it anyway. But in, in that kind of revival, we won't even be together. All of you will be doing your own crusades. We will have no, op we will not be able to stay together. There's going to be so much work to do. If a nation calls upon us, so much work to do. Uh, that man who passed away today, uh, Lucas, great guy. When I was there, this was years ago, and uh, just this the first thing I thought of when I received the news today that he died of a heart attack. He preached his message. He finished. I just watched the last clip of the actual message being preached. And he looks great. And they say right after that message, he left the stage and went and died of a heart attack. And he's, passed, he's a pastor of a very big church. When I was there, he, his elders and his leaders, they all, this is like 
12, 15 years ago. They all stood around me, laid hands on me, and prophesied over me, and said that God had showed them that I was the key to the awakening and revival of the youth of Indonesia. And when they said that, I thought, oh, yeah, right. And I just said, amen, hallelujah, praise God, and get me out of here, God. Like, I was just scared. I felt like they were coming to take me by force and make me king, like they tried to do with Jesus. So, and I didn't, and they said, they offered me house and cars and all these things, you know, because they're very wealthy. And I said, well, let me, I just, I know I'm supposed to go back to Singapore to continue to do what we're doing there. So, anyway, I left that. But today I had an interesting thought about that when he, when, when he passed on and that, this time has gone by and there's this weird freaky thing that's happened in Indonesia with me that young people love me. They just want to stand with me. They want to take pictures. It's creepy almost like it's, 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 I'm like a superstar. It's, and it's funny cause I'm so big and they're so small and like they're down here and I'm up here and they're all coming. And one little short woman, a uh, really sweet young lady, pregnant she came she was so small she was like standing to here and she put her hand on my back for the picture well she thought it was my back it was my buttocks she just grabbed my butt and just held it and she didn't know in that picture I'm like this <laughs> but it's favor that God is giving with a demograph of a nation and suddenly I was reminded of those words years ago that said, it could be, what if it's Indonesia that I bring to revival? I don't know. I, there's, I tell you what, there's a lot more I don't know than I do know. And in fact, I know very, very little. But I'm not worried about it. Because at this point in my life and ministry, I'm resting. And I just let God do it. Just if God wants it, it's going to happen. Why? For the reasons that I'm about to tell you. First of all, number three, freedom is under attack. And we have to guard it. Galatians 2, 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and uh, not running and had not been running my race in vain. So here's Paul running a race, and it's a race of freedom. He's preaching and teaching freedom, but now it's coming under attack. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Paul is essentially saying the truth of the gospel is freedom. That you be free from the bondage. Of course, these Judaizers were coming to try to get them to circumcise the men in the church because it was unlawful not to. But whose law? It wasn't the law of the Galatians. It wasn't the law of the Gentiles. It was the law of the Jews, but they were trying to convert. It was no problem in Jerusalem because they were all Jews and they were all circumcised. So just so happened to stand that those of the way or believed in Christ were already circumcised. So no issue. And, but now this region, they're not Jews. And that's why this problem came about and he had to go. But you see him here having to go through some pretty serious lengths in response to guard that freedom because it was under attack. Sometimes your freedom requires an explanation. So we learn to live in the freedom that God has given us in, in bliss. We feel so comfortable in it, but Jesus takes the chains off of our hands and feet so we're free and we run. But right about the time we start running, we notice somebody standing in the road up ahead. And any expression of freedom, any joy you have in Christ is going to be met with adversity. Somebody is not going to be happy with it. I've worked in religion for years. I worked in that ministry in the North. You've heard me say before, North Mexico, you heard me say before, the advice I got from one of the leaders in the ministry was this, never let them know you're having fun. If you want to have success in this ministry, he said, never let them know you're having fun. Couldn't believe he told me that. But he was absolutely right. And as long as I looked sour, I was comfortable. Nobody messed with me. 
For if I look too happy, they were like, wait a minute, something's wrong with him. That's strange. Isn't that backwards? It's because they were very religiously minded. And Paul was running a race of freedom. And when you are free to run and you're running, uh, we run with freedom and God does wonders. However, there always will be opposition. Be prepared to guard your freedom. You say, well, how can I guard my freedom? Well, there's different ways. One way is to put it in a safe place, in safekeeping. How do you guard your jewels? How do you guard your money? Do you have the entirety of the assets in liquid cash carried around in your pants pockets at all times? No. That'd be crazy. Just bags of gold, gold bullion. You know, you're running around cougarans and your pants are being torn off. You're trying to hold them up. And what's wrong with you? I have my entire wealth right here in my pants. Um, no, that's stupid because somebody's going to steal it. So what do you do? You put it in a safe place. You put it in a bank. Oh, safe place. But anyway, you put it in a place where it's guarded. If you have things you keep in a safe, we call it a safe because we can put things in there and no one can break in and steal it. But there's really truly only one safe place and that's in heaven. But regarding our most valuable asset, freedom given by God, sometimes to keep it and guard it, you're going to have to keep it away from people. And it's true. Another way to guard your freedom is also to savor it. If you have a valuable thing, you don't consume it immediately. If somebody gets you a, a very fine spice or a very fine food or something, you don't just engulf it like a, like a hamburger at McDonald's. You take your time. You know, they get you that um, panettone. You get you that nice bread. And you, you do, do you eat when you get it? That's, that's Michele's favorite. Do you eat it like just all at one time, the whole thing? Don't you kind of spread it out? You want it to last, right? So that's the same thing we do at Freedom. Kind of, you want to spread it out, make it last. And an American, as an American, I see a failure right now in the realms of the youth of my nation. And I think it's true globally. In fact, for the first time, the globe seems to be pretty much the same everywhere. Cultures in, around the world, there's, there's differences, nuances, cultural distinctions. But as far as the youth that are all being schooled by the World Wide Web, there's the same basic problem. And it's a lack of appreciation for the freedom in which they're living. Freedom, Singapore, so blessed, so prospered, so amazing. The jewel. Have you seen the jewel? Have you seen the images on the inside? Barbara had an early access ticket. She was able to go in. So the largest waterfall in, in, in built in the world. It's just amazing. I was looking at the images. It looks like something out of a science fiction movie. And that Singapore, what is that? All of that is built on, if you go back in the history of this country just 50 years ago, blood, sweat, tears, People have nothing, just striving to create an infrastructure that their children could have more. And then those children having a little bit more, but still striving to do the same thing, to produce now a level to where all the young Singaporeans are big. You notice how many big people now you see? Why? Because they're eating meat. That's why. They're eating a lot of meat. Honestly, it's come down to simply they're ingesting large amounts of protein because now the resources are there. I see kids on the trip. When I first came to Singapore just you know, 14, 15 years ago, I was bigger than everybody. Now I'm getting pretty average in that MRT car with these kids with their basketball uniform, their sport, they're doing things. Their chests are bigger. Their arms are bigger. I'm seeing buff Singaporeans. Why? Because of prosperity, because of freedom. And I don't think they really appreciate where it's come from. And one thing for sure that will cause you to lose your freedoms is a lack of appreciation of it. Esau lost his birthright because he didn't appreciate it. So I think it behooves us to educate the youth about how they need to appreciate the world in which they're living. There's some youth here, but I'm not really talking to you guys. <laughs> Unless it applies, then yes, please do take it to heart. So we can guard our freedom by holding on tight to it, not squandering it, measure it out carefully, appreciating the value of it. And we must value freedom to go. You have to value it to begin with to even want to guard it. And I value my freedom above all things. 
Number four, freedom to serve others, not self. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Say amen. He's just saying it clear. You're called to be the calling. Ecclesia called out of the world, out of the darkness into his marvelous light. For what? To be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. It's really good advice concerning freedom. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbors as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So say, walk by, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Why? Because it is always the predilection and impulse of the spirit that you use your freedom to serve people. And the spirit always wants others to be your focus. As does Jesus, as was Jesus, son of man, came not to be served, but to serve, he said. So that's the image. We're to follow our elder brother, Jesus. He's the chief and the leader, the, the prototype that we follow. And, and if you bite and devour each other, watch out. You'll be destroyed by it. So walk by the spirit. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want for yourself. You understand it in context. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And this is talking about, of course, it is um, preceded by the words, serve one another. The law is fulfilled in love your neighbors yourself. And it says here that you should do that. The flesh desires what is contrary to what? Contrary to the Spirit. Well, he just said the Spirit is instructing us to love others. And it's funny how your flesh fights against that. It always wants you to be taken care of before anyone else. And it's hard. It's where sacrifice comes that you give and you take care. God wants you blessed, but he wants you to bless to be blessed. Freedom. Use your freedom. Serve one another humbly in love. Paul was free, right? We know that. He was completely free. And if anybody felt free, it was Paul. Because he was under more bondage than any of those guys. Concerning the law, perfect, he said. You know what you had to do to be perfect in the law? You had to do everything. Dot every I, cross every T. That's bondage. From the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, you are in bondage. Everything you do. Do your food, your the way you walk, uh, the condition of your house. I mean, the laws were stringent and specific. Everything that you do, and he got set free from that, and could, while being with the Gentiles, be just like them and disregard those laws. He was breaking laws left and right, and it didn't matter because he understood freedom. Then he got it, and that's why he also got in trouble. Because the Jews who were still living in Jewish culture could not understand a man who had been a Pharisee converting and doing such wild, crazy things. But they were also the same people that had issues with Jesus, friend of sinners, which we just saw. So in this case, he was aware, Paul was aware because he knew the, the, the law very well. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. This was because he knew without a doubt, that the law was the image of things. So he took that and he used it. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God slaves, is what Peter said. And we're just finishing now. Number five, freedom is for eternity. This is the last verse. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into what? Into the freedom and glory of the children of God. I like that, the freedom and the glory of the children of God. Freedom is... Our eternal connection. Freedom is for eternity. The freedom we've been given is not just for us to enjoy on earth, but it is our access to forever. And when we live in this freedom, even the world around us, the physical earth that is subject to the decay of 
the periodic chart em elements and the way things break down. It's die. Everything's dying all the time. So we, but our freedom gives us eternal life. And creation itself is groaning, hoping, and wanting to be a part of our freedom because it too will be free from decay, which is amazing. A new heaven, a new earth. The earth will then be free and there will be, the earth will not age because time has no effect on freedom. So to live in freedom is to live in the eternal presence of God. So we see freedom, we see from God, and it is the revealed glory to come when we are metamorphosized into his heaven in our heavenly forms. And the freedom stops the effects of time and decay. Time has no effect on our liberty. Your body breaks down, you get sick. If you really understand freedom, you'll get healed because you're accessing the powers of the world to come because it is free. Heaven is free. How many of you think there's bondage in heaven? There's no bondage in heaven. Heaven is completely free. Don't you know in eternity you will be free to do whatever you want to do? But will you? No. It says you will serve God day and night in his temple. I'm so excited about that. Be priests forever. Priests forever. We will do. Why would we do it for free? See, that's because we've been deceived with the mentality of retirement. That you retire so that you can just... Do what you want, cruise ships around the world. And uh, I, I said that I've seen it a long time. God's going to raise up an army of missionaries out of Singapore, and it's the old age pensioners. And they all think they're going to just have fun and rest. No, God's going to mobilize them into the nations. He showed me that, and I'm going to be here to send them, train them. So while we are on earth, we're learning about the eternal freedom by living free now. Amen. But this freedom lived in wisdom of the scriptures. These are the five facts that we saw. We'll close. Freedom is under our control for good. Freedom opens our eyes. Freedom is under attack. We must guard it. Protect your freedom. Also be careful because your freedom can be like your pearls and you put your pearls before swine. They will trample it and then turn around and attack you. And it's true. Freedoms can get people in trouble. So what do you do? You put your Legos in your office. It's just whatever it is, you just you keep that to yourself. Freedom is to serve others, not self. And number five, freedom is for eternity. And I'm excited about being free. I'm, I, for one, am very glad. Why don't we stand up? We're going to pray. I'm very glad that we are free. And I'm going to continue to live in that freedom.